This is a story about a shaker dresser. The clients wanted it to be cherry, and I had some rough parameters of 30 inches high, 60 inches wide, and 20 inches deep. Time to get to work. For me, the hardest part of every project is the planning process. What joinery methods will I use? Where am I going to get each component from? Hardwood isn't cheap, and mistakes cost a lot. So I try to visualize each piece of the project before I cut anything. This probably isn't everyone's process, but it works for me. Once I make my rough cuts, it's time to start the milling process. Jointing a flat face, planing a parallel face, edge jointing a straight edge, then ripping the last edge to give me square stock. For this project, I needed to start with the most essential pieces, the panels for the carcass. I needed two side panels, a middle divider, and a tabletop, so after I milled some pieces, I laid out panels for biscuits and glue. I know a lot of people might say a jointer is a luxury tool to have in the shop, but for my process, a really well-tuned jointer is essential for making truly flat and square stock, which makes panel glue-ups like this a lot less stressful. You'll notice that I leave some of the mill marks on the underside of the top. I like to do this A, to keep the stock as thick as possible, and B, it's one of those things I like to do to keep a little reminder of the process of such a refined piece of furniture, even though it will likely never be seen again. Just a little nod to the Sawyer. I like to be as efficient as possible with my clamp usage, so I clamp up both side panels at the same time, just remembering not to add glue between the two panels. I also try to add equal clamping pressure from both the top and bottom, as well as not clamping too hard. That ensures I get nice, flat panels. Lately, for cleaning up glue squeeze out, I use planar shavings of whatever species I'm working with. It seems to pick up the glue well, saves a rag or a paper towel, and it seems less messy than coming back and scraping the uncured glue. With my panels out of the clamps, I trim them to their final width, do a cleanup pass at my 20 inch planer, which is a huge time saver. Then cut them to final length on the table saw sled. Next, I prepped some stock for what would become the horizontal stretchers. These are what tie all the vertical panels together. I wanted to utilize sliding dovetail joinery for this piece, so I wanted the stretchers around three inches wide to really make these joints structural as well as a design feature. You'll see what I mean in a little bit. So while I'm milling this stock down, you'll notice I'm using a lot of grizzly machinery. And longtime viewers of this channel know that Grizzly and I have a really, really good relationship. So good, in fact. I'll put a link in the description to all the Grizzly tools I use in my shop that you can save 10% on using code WALKER10 at checkout. Like the jointer or this big planer, the table saw, band saw. You get it. Okay, just thought I'd mention that. Back to the build. To cut the dovetail dados, I used a dovetail bit in my router and this parallel jig I threw together. With these joints, setup and repeatability is everything, so I had a small piece of scrap I'd use to dial in the guide for each dado. For the sliding tails, I set up my router table with the same bit and used a jig that straddles the fence of my table saw slash router table. At five feet long, these stretches were pushing the limits of my shop using this technique, but it works really well. When fitting my sliding dovetails, I like to leave tails a little tight off the machines, then pair them to fit with a sharp chisel. Then I dry fit the stretchers. You can see here why I wanted to keep the stretchers wide, as they really offer a lot of rigidity in the piece even without glue or a back panel. When I was cutting my dovetailed dados, I accidentally cut some that weren't supposed to be there in the inside of the back of one of the panels, so I just fit some scrap. I could have used cherry to try to blend it in, but you'll never see it behind the drawers, so I used maple in case anyone is ever examining this piece. I like to hide little easter eggs like that whenever I screw up. 
For the top stretchers, sliding dovetails weren't going to work, so I laid out some half-blind dovetails. Mainly for their strength, and when working with a piece this long, it can be hard to clamp a piece like this, so using a joint that's somewhat self-clamping can be a huge benefit. Over at my bandsaw, I made my kerf cuts to cut out the tails, then took them back to the bench to chop out the waist with the chisel. This is a matter of good joinery rather than aesthetics. Even though these dovetails won't be seen, it's a good joint for this application because it uses conflicting geometry to pull the sides together. With a little practice, it can be a really efficient joint, and they are far more forgiving than through dovetails, which show two faces. With my tails cut and cleaned up, I transfer them onto the pin or the socket board. In through dovetails, this is the pin board. In half blinds, it's called a socket. So I marked my sockets with the waist, then used a chisel to give myself a wall for my saw to ride against. I sawed down to my lines at an angle until I reached the layout lines on both the top and face of the board. Then with a sharp chisel, I cut across the grain at the bottom of the socket and then come down splitting the grain from the top of the socket and repeat. Once most of the waste is gone, I pare down to my layout lines and check the fit. Again, this particular joint won't be seen, but it's always great to get in good dovetail practice, and I'm really, really happy with this fit. I cut the sliding dovetails on the center divider and some matching dados in the top and bottom stretchers. Next, it was time to dry fit the side panels and stretchers to transfer some layout lines for the next joint. For this joint, I'm nesting the middle stretchers and center divider with a joint called a halved joint. It's a cousin to the half lap joint, but the joint occurs between the edges of the piece instead of the faces. Semantics. Then it was time for the big show, the carcass glue up. This is when, if you planned out everything properly, it should all go without issue. Luckily, in this case, it all worked out well. This sequence is a good example of a clampless assembly. If I were to use mortise and tenons for this piece at five feet long, I would be starved of clamps. Instead, the sliding dovetails and half blind dovetails pull it all together, and the half joints reference and self center themselves. Not a single clamp was needed for this assembly. With most of the carcass work done, it was time to turn my focus on the drawer boxes. I'm making my boxes out of poplar, which is a fantastic secondary wood. I'm starting here with five quarter stock. If you watched my video on buying hardwood lumber, you would know that this is an inch and a quarter thick. I cut the pieces down into more manageable sizes that I can get multiple components from, then mill them flat and square. Then I rip the pieces to 7 inches, which will be the depth of my drawer boxes. I'm aiming for half inch thick box sides, so once I have the boards milled down, I resaw them in half at the bandsaw. I know a lot of people are intimidated by resawing at the bandsaw. There are a lot of great resources on the subject, mainly a well-tuned bandsaw, sharp blade, and even feed pressure are key. Maybe I'll do a future video on it. 
Resawing lumber is one of the most satisfying techniques in the shop, so if you haven't tried it, you're doing yourself a disservice. Anyway, I planed all the pieces to remove the bandsaw marks, then cut them all to length. I'll be using machined half-blind dovetails for the boxes to speed up the process since there are six boxes with four corners each, and I laid out the box sides and marked each piece A through D on each corner, which are the tailboards and the inside faces, and I'm using this dovetail jig I got off Amazon from Porter Cable. It seems to work really well for this application and has a lot of other joints you can cut with it, but I'll put a link in the description. I think this is a big money maker for me as you can really batch out the process. With all of my box sides cut and dovetailed, I cut a groove for the floating bottom, making sure to go through a tail so the groove would be hidden once assembled. I'd make one pass on all the sides, then move the fence over and make another pass. I'd use a small piece of the drawer bottom to test the fit. Once I had all of my grooves cut, I cut the drawer bottoms out of quarter inch maple ply. With everything cut, it was time to assemble all of the drawer boxes. Assembly on boxes like this is far less dramatic, but satisfying in itself. I sanded all the interiors of the box, applied glue, then started knocking sides together. Again, this is a clampless process, so it moves pretty quick. Knock three sides together, slide in the drawer bottom without glue, then add the last side. I'll pull diagonals to make sure they're square, then move on to the next one. With all of my drawer boxes assembled and my carcass dry, I needed to add a curved stretcher to the bottom, sort of an apron. It's decorative, but also helps support the weight of the drawers and center panel so they should never sag. I had this one piece of cherry with a really cool curving grain pattern. I thought it would be perfect. I laid out a big sweeping curve using a leftover piece of that quarter inch ply, then cut it out on the bandsaw. Another supremely satisfying activity in the shop is using the spoke shave. I don't get to use it often, but when I do, it's always a lot of fun. Now, up until this point, I've used all fairly traditional joints, but being as the shakers were pragmatic, I thought the best way to attach the apron stretcher through its end grain would be pocket holes. The back apron was made of a secondary wood and I used pocket holes to act as clamps while the glue dried, then added a back panel. Once the back was taken care of, I flipped the piece over and added the front apron stretcher. In the front apron, I only use the pocket holes through the end grain, since simply gluing end grain to long grain would likely result in a failure. I used clamps and glue for the long grain to long grain joint. I think the pocket hole screw gets a bad rap for being overused in poor joinery methods, but I think correctly used with thought about joint strength and grain direction, they are a perfectly acceptable joinery method. You can crucify me in the comments if you think I'm wrong, but I stand by my decision. With the piece still upside down, I chamfered all the bottom edges to prevent splitting when being dragged across a floor. It was time to start the finishing process. I wrestled the carcass into a manageable position, then took to scraping the panels. Sanding is a great surface treatment, but there was so much subtle figure in this wood I knew I needed to draw it out. A card scraper is an excellent surface treatment for this sort of thing. For the front carcass, I relied on sanding, then I trimmed the top to its final width. The top was too wide to fit through my planer, so I took my smoothing plane to it. This isn't a tedious process with a sharp iron and a tuned hand plane, but it does take more focus than simply sending it through a planer.
With the top surfaced, I flipped it over and added a cove profile to the underside with a router. For the finish, the client wanted a soft, easily renewable finish, so we decided on a Danish oil, which is incredibly easy to apply. You just apply it and wipe off the excess. I don't think I would necessarily use it on something like a kitchen tabletop, but for a dresser, I think it's a fine application. I added my brand to the drawer bottoms and signed and dated the piece. Here you can see that subtle figure jump out of the carcass as I add oil to it. This is the stuff I love. Back to the drawers. I rough cut the drawer faces to have grain continuity over the width of the dresser. That is to say, both the left and right drawer front would come from the same board, so the grain would flow through from left to right. I got a nice piston fit on each drawer face before deciding how much reveal I wanted with the inset. While I thought about that, I used my biscuit joiner to cut slots around the perimeter of the inside of the top for Z-clips. These clips are designed to allow for seasonal movement of the top. This is the first time using these particular clips, and they were just okay. They didn't seem to have very much hold down power, so I ended up using a lot of them just to be sure. Next, I install the drawer slides. I'm using full extension soft closed slides and I like to install them in two pieces. The track I install inside the carcass using scrap spacers and the mating piece I install on the drawer box. It makes it easy to get everything centered in the opening that way. With the boxes installed, I turned my attention back to the fronts. I had posted on Instagram asking what reveal people like to use on their inset drawers, and it seemed split down the middle between 1 16th of an inch and 3 30 seconds. Since I like to use playing cards as shims, five playing cards was right around a 16th of an inch, so that's what I ended up going with. I trimmed all of my drawer fronts down, then bored some round mortises for the poles at the drill press. I could have turned these poles myself, but I thought ordering them was an easier way to make sure they all matched exactly. After gluing those in, I temporarily attached the drawer faces with hot glue, then pulled the drawers out and fastened them more securely with panhead screws from the inside of the drawer. Then all that was left to do was oil the drawer fronts and call it done. This project was a fun exercise in balancing traditional joinery methods, adhering to the shaker design motif, trying to work smarter while still achieving a high-end result, and thinking through the process. I love how this project turned out, and more importantly, so did the clients. I love the exposed sliding dovetails and the grain continuity of the drawer fronts, and I'd love to hear what your favorite part of the project is. And as always, thanks for watching.